the next item that we have today is the adoption of the minutes. Uh, these go back to October 12th, 2017. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a, a meeting last month. Um, I move that we have a second. Minutes. This is the October meeting. Is there a second? Second. second. I have a question on this. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, on page three or four under G, when we talked about the microchipping ownership, that was a question that mm -hmm. Pat Hubbard had. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forgot what our direction was to you guys on staff in regards to how we determine, you know, what the policy is for identifying the proper owner when we have somebody that's different, you know, to bring the animal in and the microchip doesn't read with who the owner is. And I remember that uh, you guys were going to look, I thought I don't know if you guys were going to look into it and come back with some kind of response. Yeah. Um we we're asking to be able to come and respond at the January meeting because we have uh, our animal protection unit moving today through tomorrow, so they could not be here to speak to that. Trust me, we'll that to next meeting. But that's what, did, did, did we agree that you guys would look into it and come back? We did, and it's not a, um, not it's, a it's a complex issue. issue because it's really case by case and very much depends on the particular um, situation, but they, they're better to explain all of that. Okay, because I think the concern is just that we maybe have some direction out in the community when they run into that, like at vets offices around town mm -hmm. or wherever, so that there might be some direction needed from, from animal care about what to do. Um, all right, with that question, any other, any further questions? There's a motion on the floor. Okay, all those in favor of said motion signify by saying aye. Mm -hmm. Aye. All those opposed? A motion carried unanimously. Uh, next item, the director's communication. The first thing um, I have down is, I don't know why I have the snapshot, but let's do the director's report first. Um, and all of you should have seen it in the packages. Um, instead of, you might just say, Kristen, the time, are there some qu any questions on it that you'd like to ask first before she reviews it? Okay. Um, I had I had a few questions. Um, on page two, the last bullet in the top half of the page it says, in order to streamline and improve customer service, we're going to merge the dispatch with the support center. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of curious, what exactly, you know, what function do you see that you're merging when you're putting together that makes things better? You know, having some of the uh, dispatch. You know, with the support center. Um, I just was trying to think about, you know, um, just because I was curious. You know, what the dispatch officers were trained 15 to 20 years ago on policies that are no longer current with our modern standards of trying to provide support, resources, and education to keep pets out of the shelter. And um, they're amazing at their job. They've been doing it a long time, but their first answer is to bring it to the shelter. Um, and we also realize that there's some duplication of services happening, so people are calling pet support and calling dispatch, and there's some confusion around, um, there's different answers given, and it's one of the common five problems is if you ask 14 people uh, one question, you get four, 17 different answers. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this merging is really as much of an effort to cross-train and ensure that everyone gives the same answer and that that first answer isn't always to bring the pet into the shelter, that there's times when we can provide support and resources to keep it out. Um, the Pet Support Center is linked into all of our grants. We have a grant, for instance, called Keeping Families Together where we pay um, up to $1,000 in medical support to keep pets from being surrendered to the shelter. Um, so through merging these two departments, they'll still have unique functions, um, and dispatch will still answer dispatch calls, but they'll be um, re efficiently cross-trained so that they um, are able to provide correct, accurate answers that uh, reflect all the services and support we can offer. Okay. I, when I read this, I was thrilled because there's so much separation and this is going to make it this is this is a big step mm -hmm. this is a really big step and i'm really impressed i can't wait to see how this is going to work out in my experience and i think i've been around about 19 years dispatch is it's just sort of an entity into its own and yeah. you never and now that you can merge these 
they're probably going to be more interactive too. With yeah, and PUT, thank you for saying that. And PUT support, importantly, is grant funded. It runs out of funding. If we don't get more funding, we're done in a year. And we don't want to lose that. And so this is another, this is a way to protect the PUT support center. If we're to ever lose that grant funding and can't sustain it, we'll have our dispatch officers also trained in those functions. So um, it's a way to buffer against possible loss of revenue, which would end the program. Is there any merging of supervisory responsibility when you put the two together and dispatch report to the sports center or vice versa? They're both going to report to Cynthia Spella, who is currently managing the pet support center. Okay. So when she, so she'll have an opportunity with the dispatch personnel and communicate all the different information that they have? Yes. Okay. All right. Any other questions on that? Right, yeah. I have a question. It's a little related to this. Um, I know the office intake opens like at noon during the week but for licensing and intake. Well, I've been now at PAC a couple times and almost every day somebody finds a stray and tries to bring it in before noon. And there's always an issue. We, we run around looking for some staff person to deal with them. People don't want to wait. And they can't always, they're on the way to work and they found the dog. Is there any way we, there can be streamlined way that volunteers can find out who to call if that's a problem because when we're out walking and we're the ones who get tagged because it looks yeah. like we know what's happening. Um, it's something that we're talking about and we're waiting to see what happens when we get into the new space okay. because we've done a pretty poor job with like directional signage in the past and explaining to people the procedures why they're in place and so we're doing a lot in this new facility you'll see with signage mm -hmm. and we're hoping that with more and more and better information that we um, don't have quite as many problems I think half of what happens before we open is that people are lost okay. and by the time you get them to the um, place where they surrender you know there's no signage and they're just sort of standing out there by a trailer right so we're kind of waiting to see what happens once we moved and identify our we're going to just sort of have a list of top 10 needs mm -hmm. um, once the move happens okay great thanks any questions okay um, I have another one on uh, under life saving operations you identified that there are 900 shelter pets housed in foster homes is that is that normal to have that many, or are we shooting to have more? Is it Some problematic them, that they just um, get stuck in foster homes forever? Yeah, so know? part of the, one of the Maddie's fun positions is kicks in at the moment the pet goes to foster and helps them get to a permanent outcome. We don't have that position left yet, so we have a bottleneck. Um, a lot of those animals went out as foster to adopt, and they're animals that we just need to outcome. But we don't outcome them until we um, meet and counsel, speak with and counsel the family member who's adopting them. So probably the total number in fosters closer that that aren't being adopted by their foster are closer to 600, and that's a fine thing. But they need to have help getting them per getting those animals permanently adopted. Yeah, that's what I was concerned about because if you look at our total numbers for adoptions during the course of the year, you know, it's right around five five fifty six hundred anyway, and so mm -hmm. we have the same amount out with not at the shelter to get, you know, traffic and things like that to see them. So I was just wondering how we were managing that if our families were just stuck in perpetuity, you know, out of space. <laughs> Somebody's house. <laughs> so you're saying that the new person should, part of that, their responsibility would be to try to start moving those animals. Move them through to permanent get, outcomes. Get decisions made, whatever. Yeah, but, remember we sent a lot of animals to foster because we've been battling pneumo virus for now five months and it's back. Um, and we moved uh, a couple hundred dogs this summer, attempting to keep the population down. Um, so we've had a, a lot of animals in foster, but a lot that just need to be outcomed. A lot of them are staying with their foster families. So. Okay. Um, I could, may I just sure. add a couple yeah, other things to this? Um, so we were surprised when Petco handed us a check at the premiere, uh, Tammy was there. She saw, I had to look at it like five times because I thought it was like a $10,000 check and I kept being like, wait, a two of five zero and three zeros is how much? 
Um, so that was really exciting. That's to support the kitten memory care program and other community-based programs. So we're going to be hiring a coordinator who will um, manage all of those. Um, and we are opening, one thing that's not and that it's important is that we're putting up a web page this week onto our website that's going to have a link to a feedback form. And that feedback form is to be used by everyone, whether it's public, volunteers, or staff, to have to share concerns or questions about the new facility. Um, we want to make sure that everyone's questions and concerns are being addressed in a timely manner. And so one of the challenges is we get 300 emails a day, and they go to 10 different people, and we're not sure who responded. And so this is going to help us make sure that we're responding and um, addressing any concerns. And is that a, yes. is that a, a new position in Japan? It sounds like a, a key. No, Kino's going to do it. Oh, is mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they'll go to Kino and probably uh, Michelle as well. Um, and then the last thing is that we were open this year on Black Friday. We did an adoption promotion. We had a massive number of adoptions, 250 for the weekend. Um, and it shows the power of being open on holidays. When we're open on holidays, there's always a question about paying for staffing, but I believe we see time and time again all over the country that many people are bored on holidays or lonely or they don't celebrate them, and adding a pet to their family is exactly what they want to do. So um, it's our hope that in the next year we're open most holidays and not closed on them because there are huge missed opportunities for adoptions. And outside of staffing, I think that's really it. So we're going to talk about that in the next item. Yeah, and um, I was kind of stalling a little bit because I wanted to, I, I, I forgot to, I thought it would be nice if the committee members went around and introduced themselves to new staff. But I wanted to wait until Andrew got here because he's important being a rep for the city of Tucson. Um, so, I said he'd be here. He was leaving I-10. Um, anything else in your report you want to talk about? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I guess the move, it's underway, it started. Um, we moved the clinic today. New shelter is not perfect, but it's one of the nicest, faci nicest municip municipal facilities that I've seen. There are going to be some challenges with the new building, but we're going to address them. and I. I think looking around, we have to remember that the goal is to shorten length of stay so that this is truly just short-term housing for the vast majority of our animals. Um, and for short-term housing purposes, this facility is perfect. It's based on a flow model. So from the minute they come in the door, they're flowing through the system to adoption in a much more strategic way. Um, for instance, a dog that comes in as a stray and we locate the owner, they go in a kennel right behind intake so they don't have to be brought to a permanent kennel. They're just held right behind intake until their owner can come reclaim them. Um, so we're on schedule. We're the, we will move all the animals Monday. Christy's going to help and a few other very select volunteers. We did invitation only for volunteer help that day because of safety concerns and because it's still a construction site. We have to be really careful about how many people are going to be moving. Um, and so we're going to move all the animals on Monday. Starting Tuesday, we're open for business in the new building. It's a soft opening while we pilot. We're actually a week ahead of schedule. So we're going to, from the 19th to the 26th, we're really piloting life in the new facility to see how it works. Um, and so far, so good. Let's go over the data summary. Uh, and see if there's any questions with that. Um, do you guys have any questions on the data snapshot? Um, I, I just bought something that's interesting. Um, the total pets, if you if you look from in November last year and this year, I, I'm just amazed how close it is. It is. Mm -hmm. And the, the live intakes, I think that's, we're doing really good there. We have, and we've added a category of raw save rate, and that's to measure 
nose is in, nose is out. So even if they're brought in for euthanasia, we're including them. And we think that's important because so many animals brought in for euthanasia are savable. Uh, most are, in fact, even if they're going to a hospice home. So we're moving more towards calculating based on that raw save rate so that no animal is rendered invisible in our statistics. Um, and we will just acknowledge that a small percentage that were brought in for euthanasia are indeed euthanized. And just looking at the euthanasia, the, this is a year ago, so it looks like it's been going on for quite a while where we've reduced the number of animals that are, that are dying in the shelters. I don't think this number is accurate on this report, the raw save oh, no. rate. It, it can't, no, I'm talking it about can't be. It can't be a lower Yeah. Um, so I'll, can, can we make sure to ask um, Josh about that, please? Thank you. It's closer to 88% raw save rate. And yeah, euthanasias are going down. So, um, I, you know, first of all, for the benefit of you, Kristen, and your staff, during the, before the transition process when Jose and uh, Justin left, um, and when Dr. Garcia used to attend these meetings, we had all agreed that we would drill in a lot on the specific snapshot numbers at each meeting, but we would wait for more of a, a quarterly or biannual like summary where we try to take a look at the numbers and see if we can make any sense of what our trends might be. Uh -huh. So first of all, I wanted to, uh, remind you of that, that at some point I think we need to do that because it's been, we haven't had a summary report now in a year, really on this data. You're going to get it next month. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, so with that said, I, I'm a little reluctant to do it, but I wanted to ask, like, I noticed our stay and neuter procedures were quite a bit higher this year than they were here last, you know, last year at the same time. I'm just kind of wondering if you have any guess on why they might be higher to say that the animal number take, take into about the same. Well, I want to speak really honestly and say that I don't have any confidence in our data oh. um, up until very recently. And even now, I think there's, we have a lot of work to do to have clean data. <laughs> um, and one example would be that the fosters, right? We know we actually have a lot more permanent life outcomes, but because so many animals haven't been processed out of foster, these numbers really aren't as accurate as they should be. And so, um, and then previous, prior to my tenure, they were counting foster as an outcome, as a permanent outcome, and then re-intaking, and all that was skewing the data. And so what we're, what we're doing now is really going through each data point and trying to make sure that we're having accurate counts and understanding how we're pulling those numbers. Um, Sarah will introduce herself in a minute, but she's a, um, really knowledgeable about crystal reports. Um, and so I'm not certain that last year's data is going to be good for comparative reasons. So we're, we're cleaning that up now, and I think it's going to be another year before we have any solid comparative data. But we are going to give you a report at the end of the month. Sorry to interrupt you. We are going to give you an annual report that is going to be a three-year snapshot. So while, there's, while the data isn't always going to be clean from the past two years, at least you'll have some idea of how the data compares over a three-year period. Okay, and I think, I think with what you just said, what's important to me uh, is that we, moving forward, we establish a baseline of what data we're collecting, how it's collected, what you feel confident in. For example, if we left out that population of foster animals, you know, and factoring them back into the overall totals, um, that we should be clear on that and that you'll update us, you know, when that comes yes. back. Uh, because this is really our measurement, you know, for the community. Yes. And we have to get these numbers right eventually. Yep. Okay. I agree. Thank you, sir. And then the other question I just wanted to just bring to your attention, you know, I, I had talked to you at one point a while back, maybe it was in your office and we were talking about special procedures that we perform. And I know that in some instances it can be an issue of uh, sensitivity, you know, politically for our board of supervisors and stuff. And I was just curious, it seemed like the numbers were way up and I was just wondering if you guys are kind of monitoring you know what procedures we're doing and why, and what and what. Uh, what numbers are up? 
it says special procedures there at 155 mm -hmm. versus 99. So it's about, not that, not that many more, but I, it was just something that kind of, I didn't do that we're, percentage. Oh, I'm on page. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, we're saving more animals. We're yeah. saving more critical medical cases, and those special procedures are typically those, those serious medical cases, whether it's an amputation or a different surgery that's saving their life. Okay. Mr. Chair, yeah, are off-site um, procedures included in your special procedures, Kristen, like if a dog has to go to V. Scott for a night? No. Okay. These are just in house, okay. Because we're doing a, quite a few of those too. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Yes. If they're going off site to say V Scott, mm -hmm. who pays the bill? Oftentimes it's friends with that. Oh, okay. So that would be yeah. why. Or it's a yeah. GoFundMe situation from the volunteers. It's a combination of the two. Cool. Yeah, but the, the data the data here though, uh, I want to make sure I'm on the same page with you guys. Is it really concerned about who's paying for it at this point? It's just the animals that are, you know, mm -hmm. care because if they're uh, nursed to health somewhere else, they're still eventually, you know, in the ownership of pack until the animal is adopted and whatever the outcome may be. That's so, true. Yeah. And our data, yeah. it, it, the reason our data is a little bit tricky is the volume is pretty tremendous, um, and it's a lot of animals moving very quickly through the system, and it, and when I say that there's issues with having clean data, it isn't because of anyone's intentions. It's really high volume, moving a lot of animals from a lot of different locations. We have numerous off-site adoption locations, so if those animals don't get processed out of the system, or they may get spayed and neutered by one of our partners. So it's really complex trying to get this stuff right. Um, and I just want to be clear about that. I don't think it was anyone's intention to not have exact um, our exact numbers, but if you don't process your off-site adoptions um, from foster, they stay in foster and make it look like you have 900 animals. So um, now it's happening on my watch too, so I'm really sympathetic about how you get behind on that stuff. Okay. Any other uh, questions on this? All right, so I'm going to take a break and we're going to go around and introduce ourselves just so that new staff members know who we are. And I apologize that not everyone is here. Uh, Dr. Erin O'Donnell is not here. She is uh, one of uh, the vets in our community and actually one of the bigger practices in town. And she's also been kind enough at many times to assist that pack and actually work in the clinic uh, when Dr. Wilcox and the others have been off site, for example. Um, and so she's a great resource for us and a great supporter of our programs. Uh, Dan Ekstrom is a committee member. That's his sign right there. Dan was a 16-year chairman of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, and he's uh, still kind of the political guru of the committee. And uh, uh, he's a great resource to have. And uh, who else are we missing? So we're missing Rhonda Pena, who is a member uh, and I forget which district she's from. Um, I don't know whether it's Mr. Lee's. I, I think it's um, Rona. No. no. Oh, she's a sister. Yes, she's a sister. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Rhonda uh, is uh, uh, also a, a city member of the Oro Valley Town Council, and they're one of our contributing partners. And Andrew Squire, who should be here in a minute, and I'll let him. He, he works for the city of Tucson in the city manager's office, and he is also the rep to Pima Animal Care for the city of Tucson. And there, they pay actually most of our budget, just slightly more than Pima County. So they're very significant in what we do. So with that, I'll go to Gail. She can introduce herself. I'm Gail Smith. I'm the board of health liaison. Basically. Susan. I'm Suzanne Derby, and I represent District One, which is. Or Valley, it's up in the north. So, yeah. And I'm Tammy Barrick, and I'm the chair of Friends of PAC. I'm Christy Oliver, and I am a volunteer representative. I'm Pat Hubbard, and I represent Sharon Bronson in District 3. And Christy's being real modest, but she's also, you know, started the Rough Runners and uh, the Walkers there at PAC, and has, she's down there constantly, you know, at nights and weekends. and. Uh, 
she's a real good giver, so I really depend on her. And I'm Gary Gillespie, and I, uh, let's see, I've been on the team a year and a half, and I've uh, been volunteering for about four years. But, uh, all right, with that said, let's go to uh, uh, the staffing in the new business. So, what vacancies do you still have that position? Yeah, um, so we coming in, we anticipated 25 to 30% turnover. Um, with the, a new director in a shelter, you can expect about that, but much less the first director of a shelter. Um, and uh, this is a massive change for our organization. Um, we've had a number of people move on from their roles, and mostly to pursue things that they um, have really sort of their passion. So Samantha Nellis, for example, has always wanted to be an elementary school teacher and finally got a job in elementary school. Um, Karen Hollis just moved on to take an opportunity at the University of Arizona doing um, large development and big gifts. Um, and so we've been down about 17 to 18 vacancies. Some of those are people that either left before my tenure or during. Some of those are brand new positions, um, and some of those are converted positions. We've hired a number of folks and really scored some top-notch national talent over the last couple of months. Um, we just, uh, we're about to make an offer to our um, first candidate out of Austin, who's someone that I worked with in animal control there. Um, and we've hired about nine of the vacancies and had a couple of new ones. So a few of the vacant positions that still exist are um, the foster coordinator, the four foster coordinators, the medical clinic coordinator, the two trap leader in return, community cat folks. We didn't get any viable candidates in the first round, had to go back at it. Um, the adoption counselor and, and behavior assistant, both those positions we made offers, both people backed out of the process, so we're starting over on those. Um, we've hired a field services supervisor, a couple of officers, and uh, the folks I brought with me tonight. So uh, we're well on our way to build, to, to sort of rebuilding this team. And we were looking for three qualities in everyone that we hire. One, that they're in it for the team and they're driven by the mission and vision. Um, two, that they understand the role of volunteers, foster families, and rescue partners, and how important those are. And three, that they want to embrace and create best practices um, nationally in animal welfare. Um, and so we really looked for candidates with those three uh, qualities, in addition to having subject matter expertise. So we didn't want to bring in people that were new to animal welfare, because we have too much to accomplish too quickly. Um, and as much as we love starting new talent, finding people that are really inspired, we want to bring in seasoned individuals from around the country um, and from our own community who um, can walk in and do the job tomorrow. So with that, I'll introduce, may I, may I introduce the new team members we brought? Yeah, and then, uh, did, well, I guess you kind of covered the recruitments that are in process and plan. So yeah, that's good. I'm going, to let, I'm going to ask them to say a few words about themselves um, and, and share their um, brief biographies with you. Um, but uh, needless to say, every single one of these people is a huge score for our team. Um, and I feel like we're like playing a massive game here, and every time we bring one on, it just like builds this amazing strength that's going to carry us forward. So we'll go ahead and start with Sarah. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, I am the new deputy director for PAC. Um, my name is Sarah Aguilar. Sarah, hi, Sarah. <laughs> Hello. Um, I have not been in animal sheltering for a long time. Uh, relatively short compared to what some of our team members um, have in their pocket for experience. Um, I do have a background in business management, um, including an advanced degree. I have um, experience doing restaurants and customer service and working for large corporations. And um, the short version is uh, two and a half years ago, I had a, three and a half years ago, sorry, I had a, uh, was in a major accident. 
and my entire life changed. And as I was recovering, um, I started getting involved in, in some animal volunteering. And have, you know, I'd already always had pets. And the moment that I joined, a, um, got involved in this this rescue, I was like, this is what I'm here for. This is this is why I'm on this earth. This is what I'm meant to do. Um, it became my my mission, my my life goal to uh, to save lives, to be a part of, of doing whatever's possible to make an impact and to, uh, to to revolutionize how things are done. And I'm very thankful to have that opportunity here, and look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sarah is being modest, but she's a program. <laughs> She's a program manager in Ventura County Animal Services in Ventura, California, where she um, sort of like made history, um, sending a, under her uh, direction, they sent a number, a record number of pets of any shelter into um, foster homes, got them adopted. Um, they made the national news a number of times for all their innovative programs related to shelter pets particularly um, in getting them out of the shelter even for an hour and showing the impact that could have. Um, and I met her in Austin briefly at an apprenticeship opportunity. And at these apprenticeships, we bring in students from all over the country and we spend four days with them and we give them about 50 things to go home with. We give them 50 things to go home and do and everybody goes home and does like one of them. And it's really a frustrating experience. Sarah went home and did them all. Um, which had a great impact, and it, and it really said a lot um, to me about her commitment to doing right by the animals. And so um, having her here is uh, going to be another daily face of leadership in the shelter. Um, and she's going to really be dealing with some of those nitty-gritty issues that are, um, for instance, volunteers taking sick and injured animals to the medical clinic and not being able to get immediate help. That's going to be her first order of business behavior dogs that we don't know if we're making the right decisions on what dogs we're euthanizing. Uh, we don't have a, a, a really good process for that. It's going to be her work. So she's going to be really busy um, tackling some of those difficult issues in the shelter, but she's a problem solver. So thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Patricia Kelso. I am the new adoptions program coordinator. I just started on Monday. So along with her, um, so we're diving right in. I moved to Tucson from uh, the Bay Area in July, and I've been kind of sitting and watching job postings on the website um, because this is. I've most recently been in sheltering for the past six years, and this is just kind of my thing. Um, and I really feel like it's it's probably it's my calling if you if you have one. Um, so I've been waiting and waiting, and um, great postings came up, and I had the opportunity to interview, and I was really excited about the things that I was seeing on Facebook and just all the programs and, and kind of the openness and the willingness of PAC to reach out to the community and, and um, ask for help and, and get involved. So um, most recently, what I did work in sheltering uh, was just my last, my last job. Um, I worked in adoptions, I worked in intake, I was a foster care coordinator. Um, but most recently, I was the uh, clinic manager or coordinator at Humane Society Silicon Valley in Milpitas. I loved it, and I, I miss everybody, and I hated leaving, but I'm really <laughs> excited um, about what we're going to be doing doing here. When Patty, when Patty's colleagues found out she was applying for the job with us, they started like randomly emailing me to tell me how amazing she was. Um, so she came with some pretty stellar references and a lot of experience from the shelter that probably has the very best customer service um, of any shelter that I know. Um, and so she's going to bring a customer focus to the team that we haven't had before. Uh, I'm Bennett Simonson. I'm the new animal protection supervisor. I came here from Charlotte, North Carolina, where I ran the Pets for Life program at the Humane Society of Charlotte. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Pets for Life program, but it's a grassroots outreach program that goes into underserved communities and it basically works on the premise that when people are suffering, animals are suffering and you can't address the suffering of the animals without also seeing the realities of the people and addressing both of them at the same time. So uh, when I found out Kristen was coming here, I was really excited to try to find a, a niche here and come 
work for Pat because I know amazing things are going to start happening. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to bring that idea of seeing, bringing empathy um, or expanding the idea that's already there in animal protection, um, of, of bringing empathy to people and trying to address the, the core root of why there is suffering in a situation and help fix that problem um, rather than just throw punitive measures on somebody and, and have it happen again. We want to try to solve somebody's problem and help them out with their animal, help them keep their animal, um, and have better outcomes for both the pet and the person. Um, so I, I'm super excited to see the wonderful things we can do. I would imagine you'd be getting a lot of tips from the support center or there'd be a lot of coordination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're definitely going to work really closely. Right. Ben is helping us lead our animal protection services into the next step, which is the next phase, which is to um, exactly what he said, but Pets for Life is the Humane Society of the United States program, and it's nationally recognized. It's probably the coolest, most innovative thing that's happened in animal sheltering in the last decade. Um, and so getting someone with that expertise is really uh, exciting because he can bring that skill set to our team and help all of our officers think help first, punish second, and save those punitive measures for the truly egregious offenders, not the people that have a straight eye that need somebody to put up a fence for them. Uh, Stephanie Stryker, PAC Programs Coordinator at PAC. I um, have informally been a part of the team for the past three years uh, as the Community Cat Project Assistant and then Coordinator for Best Friends Animal Society, our Trapper to Return and Shelter to Return um, Assistants. I've been in animal welfare for six years, started out um, doing animal care uh, with cats in a rescue in Phoenix. I uh, went up and spent some time with Best Friends Animal Sanctuary uh, with Leukemia Cats, and now I'm here to work on the PAC team. Uh, be working with program development with the other staff members to um, cultivate better foster programs for the cats, um, help give them appropriate enrichment and socialization opportunities to help them meet the best possible outcomes. Thank you, Stephanie. Welcome, you guys. Welcome. Welcome. So I wanted to make a, a comment. You know, the other night we all gathered in the new uh, multi-purpose room as a staff. I think it might be the first time Kristen said that you all were able to gather together. And likewise, this is the first time that you had an opportunity to gather with us. And we don't have the whole group today. Understandable, it's holiday time. Um, but I wanted to share with you that, and I'll be frank, just like Kristen was, you know, about our numbers, that, you know, we're working to um, re-energize and reconnect the advisory committee with the functions that you do at PAC. So what I wanted to say to you, and I, and I would encourage any of the other committee members to pipe in if they choose, is that um, we are here to support you and to help facilitate needs, visions, uh, problems that we see that we need to conquer as a community. And the way that we do that is that we build this partnership and we use our influence to go to the Board of Supervisors and to the County Management to, to uh, advocate on issues that are important to us. And if we do that in a vacuum without the buy-in or the help from a committee like this, which is a representative of people from around the community, then it always makes it tougher for us to be successful because the community may or may not buy into it. So I just wanted to have that chance to say it to you, you know, as the chairman, that as you guys work on things together, you formulate your ideas, you see your problems, you know where you want to go, all of those kinds of things. Uh, I'm hoping that we will build this bond together where we can serve as a committee that will help you achieve those things for the benefit of the animals that are in our care. Okay? Thank you. You guys got any uh, comments you want to share? I always talk too much. Um, <laughs> all right. So with that said, uh, I guess we're on to we're almost over with this meeting. Um, so we're on to the announcements. Are there any announcements from any of you that anything going on that we need to know about? 
Um, Christy, you have anything you'd like to talk about today? Um, and by the way, welcome back. We missed you. Thank you. She was in Argentina for what, a month or more? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, um, just that we're getting ready. Uh, we're getting ready for the move. Uh, there's a lot of information that you know we don't have yet, and I think we're just all going to work together to try to make it happen as quickly as possible and smoothly. Um, other than that, just because there, it hasn't been brought up elsewhere, um, I probably will bring up that there was a rabies uh, case here in town. Um, yeah, there was a, you know, it's not really a volunteer issue, but since it's not brought up anywhere else, um, there's a deceased stump found in a city park on the east side um, with some loose dogs um, in contact with it. So um, I think there's some press releases and things going out to outreach to the community and spread the word um, so that people vaccinate and um, anyone in that general area, you know, have their pets, you know, have their pets checked out. So there is a press release on the Pima Animal Care uh, website. I don't know if there's one on, um, I'm sorry, on the Facebook page. I don't know if there's one on the, there must be one on the health department site. Um, but if anyone can share that um, to everyone you know, um, then that would be something that I think is really important for the community to be aware of that that's happening right here in, in the town and the city. Yeah, we knew there were four or five dogs that were playing with the dead body. We just don't know who the dogs were because by the time our officer came, the dogs were gone. Um, and so we're trying to identify dogs that may have been playing. And anyone, and anyone who thinks their dog was should get it boosted, uh, get the vaccine boosted. I know it was up on the KOLD. It's been all over the news. Yeah, in a number of places. Um, but, I mean, sharing it yes. far and wide. Yeah. Some of the people just you know, even just talking to your neighbors, I think, is important. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I would like to just uh, announce our volunteers of the month. Uh, I don't have their certificates today, but I know Mary will get them to me. Um, the first one is Kathy Poland, um, and she's been with PAC for four years, and she's put in, at this point, 2,000 hours. Um, she walks dogs with her husband Frank, uh, and uh, but for about the for the past few months, she has been doing a lot of enrichment, and uh, she spends uh, up to eight hours making and passing out enrichment goodies for the dogs uh, to enjoy, and um, we really appreciate everything that she does. Wish she were here. Um, and then the second one is Linda Shield, uh, and Linda's been with Pat for two and a half years. Uh, with around a thousand hours uh, of dog walking and fostering, and uh, she's a really dedicated part of our dog walking team. And we appreciate it that she does too, and we'll get certificates after them uh, later. Okay. Yeah. I was wanted to say I had a question on something that Christy had said about the volunteers, about the training, about them making move into the shelter. How's that happening? Because I know there's some that all of the PAC volunteers are going to be moving over into the new facility. And you were saying that there's just a lot of training and a lot of... I think like navigating the new building, knowing where the new um, exits and entrances are going to be, um, and you know, how do we get to the park safely with, you know, dogs are, you know, always the trickiest, you know, getting in and out of the building safely where you're not going to pass another animal, um, and also for health and safety reasons. So. Um, because of it's been an active um, uh, construction site, we really haven't been able to get in there except for on a couple of um, you know uh, scheduled tours when things are very dark and still under heavy construction. So there's been a lot of good communication. There's been maps that have been sent out to us, um, and like every day it seems like more communication is coming out um, as we learn more. But it's going to be probably bumpy for a few days, I think. Well, I have brought this up to Kristen and anybody that was listening to me. Um, my understanding is in the new facility, I'm going to be with, with the architects and all the design, there's going to be areas where animals are going to be kept that have contagious diseases or illnesses. So I, I'm just curious how you're going to confine that and keep that from spreading, because you all know that we are the fomite. You know, we're the ones that spread the disease. How is how are the volunteers? We're not having the volunteers in those areas. 
the bike quarantine and medical isolation are now off limits to anyone but staff and especially trained volunteers. So we're going to be selective and provide pretty comprehensive training to the people in those areas. And um, keep in mind that now medical URI and bike quarantine have indoor outdoor kennels. So their life is not going to be the misery that it has been in that middle kennel row. I think it's important that we have some volunteers back there, but what's happened is that people have just wandered. People without training have wandered and carried disease and we haven't been able to control for it. And so this change is gonna allow us to um, have a lot better control over um, disease management. Because it's not just volunteers, I mean, public and staff. It is, yeah. and the public won't have access. I mean, right now the public can walk up to a sick dog, touch yeah. it, and walk to other dogs. So you know, I recognize that we've had problems with that, you know, spreading with people wandering through the facility, you know, over the years. So another, another thing for us to consider might also be that we have some kind of uh, people assigned to kind of manage crowd flow. Because, you know, we've, we've never really been very good at that. And people, I mean, I see it all the time, and I always get nervous when I see families, you know, walking through areas that might have disease and stuff like that. I think a lot of it would be if we just were kind of regulating, had somebody watching what's going on, you know, and controlling how people move through the facility, it might help as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? I just have, and I contemplated even bringing this up, but I'm just going to put this out there because somebody came to me and said something because they know I'm on the path board. Um, do we have somebody that monitors? the social media sites um, for, say, negative comments or things like that. Um, I had somebody that approached me and was like, Sue, you're, you know, you're on the pack board. And um, they had been on one of our sites. And I'm not sure if it was a volunteer site or if it was a regular site or what it was. But they had just one of our animals was up with their story, their backstory, and what had happened to them and why they were surrendered. Um, and there were a lot of negative um, comments, and I know it's a knee-jerk reaction for a lot of people, but a lot of negative comments were being made about the person that surrendered the animal. And this person's comment to me is, why would anybody surrender their animal? I mean, they basically it was like, this is why people just, you know, abandon them, because if they they feel like, you know, they, they bring them into the shelter and then it gets up there and all of a sudden all there is all these, because some of those people that are abandoning it, they're going on to these social media, they're going on to these sites, they're surrendering their animals, um, and for most of them, it's really heartbreaking, and I think people don't oftentimes look at the other side of what's happening, what they've gone through to get to that point where they feel like they have to surrender their animal. A lot of times it, it does have to do with I mean, they're heavy, heavy choices that these people are having to make to give up their animals. And then when all of a sudden, you know, these, this is happening and now there, all of a sudden there, there's these negative comments towards the people that are surrounding them, are we maybe, is there something that we can do to maybe um, soften some of that? And I don't know how, because I know we all do get very upset when somebody has to surrender an animal and, you know, and it's always, you know, you know, don't get an animal if you can't feed it. Don't do this. Don't do that. Well, it's there's got to be something that we sure. can do to maybe uh, stop some of that from happening, so we're not discouraging people, and all of a sudden, you know, we're getting the yeah. animals on the streets. Yeah, we don't. So this is like a growing national problem of uh, you know bullying on social media, which is really what it becomes. Um, we have a pretty strict county policy, so for our page. Anything that like borders on hate speech gets removed. Anything that's a personal attack gets removed. So if like that person was named, and it was like Bob, his name is Bob Jones. Go troll his page. We would delete that. Um, anything on any other page is not a pack page. It's run by volunteers or advocates. Even if it says the words pack, um, the volunteer page isn't closed group, so it's not a public page. Anything that happens on those pages is, you know, protected by First Amendment freedom of speech. And what we encourage people to do is just to go on and, and provide counter comments. And volunteers and advocates can sort of like, I mean, social media is mean. Um, and 
if we, we as sort of like people that don't want to punish people after to under their animals can say what you just said on social media and it helps a lot. Um, so that's what we encourage people to do. You know, that's a, it's a topic that I think maybe we ought to explore further because even, and you know, I'm a volunteer and I support what the volunteers have done, you know, in terms of uh, being a stimulus for much of the change at PAC over the years, uh, and that's really important. But I would think that even if they are private pages, if the people that are moderators of those pages are PAC volunteers, then we should have a code of ethics in terms of, you know, we, we just don't uh, expect you to be bullying people, that kind of thing. Yeah, I agree. I think the, the PAC page, the internal PAC page, was started as a place for volunteers to vent. I've run two other social media pages, and we had really strict guidelines. The guidelines were that you shared information about animals, you shared um, things that you needed. So Christy all the time does awesome things, like we'll say, like, we really need walkers this day, this time. That's what those pages are for. But our page, our internal page, group page, was set up for people to vent. And so, you know, we may need to decide if that's really what we want to use for, given that there's already a secret page for people to vent. Maybe they can just go there and do that. And um, I don't know if, you know, what, if this is the appropriate place to talk about that, but it is, um, we certainly have a model of social media policy for an internal group page we can follow. Well, at a minimum, I would think that it would be something that we would work with Gina on to maybe get the, when we have the group uh, volunteer meetings to remind yeah. people that, you know, we need to be careful. She did um, and there's, there, there, there's another side to this, you know, there's the impact on the individuals and I, you know, I, mm -hmm. I've had my problems judging people, you know, because I've been intake and adoptions and, you know, so I've seen it all, but um, we, we also, I think, I lost my train of thought, but, you know, we have a responsibility to, I think be aware of the problems that people have. I mean, I, I we don't know all the reasons. I, I've discovered things over the years. People, like I had one, I, I did adoptions two weeks ago, and it was a terrible day, no adoptions, until I got back to pack. And two of the dogs that I had at PetSmart both went home to their owners, and one of them I brought back to pack with me. I said, I'm not giving you the animal. I was at PetSmart until you come back to pack and talk to us about it, because the animal had been turned in. And it turns out that the person had been in the hospital for emergency surgery and their family had dumped the dog because they couldn't stay in town any longer. Okay? And so there's all sorts of stories like that that we don't know about and that people may misconstrue. It's just probably good for us to refresh people about, you know, proper behavior. But it also hurts us in terms of our uh, presence and viability with the board of supervisors and the people that represent the public. Yeah, I just think because we are, we are part, at the bottom, at the end of the day, the bottom line is we're here for the animals, but we're also, we are a county. Um, and our job is to be a service to the county. We don't want to do anything to discourage people from using our service. And we don't want to discourage them from surrendering. We want to keep the dogs in their home, but on the flip side, we don't want to discourage people from surrendering because we want those dogs to be in the safest place possible, out on the street being abandoned because they don't feel, because the surrenderer doesn't feel safe, you know, surrendering their dog is, is to me, could be, you know, it's an issue that, uh, yes, that we need to address. I agree. Yeah, uh, I think it's great that this topic came up. For those of you who don't know, I uh, was a director of the Humane Society in Southern Arizona for 27 years. And when I first started there, everybody that brought an animal in was an a-hole. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it took years, and I think that Bennett, what you're doing, what you're what you're hired to do, you can't help the animals if you can't help the people, mm -hmm. and it, it's going to start with your staff. So when these animals come in, if the staff can be understanding, that's it's going to spread. It's going to spread to the community. You know, if somebody comes in, oh, did you see that idiot drop off a stock? Well, you know what? You don't know why that. You know, they can tell you one story, but that's probably not true. I mean. My feeling is that most people are good. I mean, obviously, you know, we run into a few bad ones, especially when it comes to animal cruelty. But if your staff can't handle that, if they can't see people as human beings and not bad people, then 
we need to fix that. And, and, and if Pat fixes it, the community's going to pick up on it too. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it starts at the top. I like that. Yeah, Dr. I'm not sure, but I think the, with Pat Act 1.0, I think there was a code of ethics worked mm -hmm. on for the volunteers uh, just about this issue, about what they put on social media in the public space and in the private space about PAC, but specifically about not bad-mouthing other workers, other volunteers, and other people. So I believe that was done already. I, I don't have all my own notes, but I think that was done at one point. I mean, the, the, the question about First Amendment rights came up, but we realized it's, it's about the animals. And if we're bad-mouthing people on a public site, it makes pack look bad, and then people aren't going to come and either relieve, bring their animals in or come and dock. But I believe that has been done already. Can we find it? I, I want to I make something really clear from my perspective, and I may be wrong, and uh, you know, I'll probably get called out on it. Uh, but any of us, whether you're staff or volunteer, even if we're volunteers, we are working basically for the benefit of Pima County and the animals and the public charge. Therefore, I believe that Pima County has a right not to tell you that you can't speak because that's your First Amendment right on a website that you may have set up yourself or on a Facebook page or something else. But it doesn't mean that we have to continue to allow the person to work for us if it's problematic. And so that's where I think we need to be very clear in what our expectations are and that I want, if, if, if we need to develop, go back and find whatever we had and develop it and make it clear, that's clearly something within the realm and role and responsibility of the PAC Act Committee to endorse so that we have that on the books. And I would encourage you guys to take a look at that as staff because mm -hmm. if, 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 if it's becoming problematic where, I mean, I mean, I can give you a reverse case, not where somebody's dropping, dropping off an animal, but I can give you a case where somebody was adopting an animal, and I was working one night, and this has been a long time ago, but it was 7 o'clock at night, and the person that was adopting the dog wanted to adopt the dog, as I found out later, was just let out of drug treatment. And they seemed like they were really messed up when they came in with their father. And we actually had volunteers that called the police on them, that didn't, and I was doing the adoption. <laughs> and I was working with the father, and he admitted to me that he was never going to let that person adopt the dog, but the, the, the person in question wanted to have a dog that had just gotten out of rehab. And he came down there with his daughter, and it was kind of like a family thing. He was just trying to help her, but he realized she wasn't ready. And he told me that privately. He whispered it in my ear because he was so embarrassed. But, you know, it just, it, things can get out of hand. And then we had, you know, volunteers that called the police on them because they saw him pick his family member up and put him in the car because the person broke down because they couldn't handle the animal because they were very weak and had just gone through treatment. And so it was just a terrible situation. I remember being really upset about that. And uh, that's the opposite side of the coin. But, you know, we have to be careful about what we do. Yeah, yeah I, I would just like to go back to, we do have a social media policy, oh, sure. Sure. I signed okay. it at one point, um, so I'm sure it would be fairly easy to yeah. design, or to find and, and um, review, and, and I think it kind of goes back to what somebody said, is that, um, you know, it, it's hard to control what people say, but if they are not speaking in the best interest of the county or PAC, um, then those people maybe don't need to, to be volunteering or working at PAC anymore. Um, and I do believe that um, we have had those situations enforced. Um, and I know that Gina, in particular, who is a volunteer coordinator, has talked to volunteers frequently, uh, especially recently, about you know keeping um, keeping things positive, in, you know, to the public especially. Um, as far as some of those pages that are volunteer run, and I'm a moderator for one of them. Um, Sometimes it is kind of tricky. Sometimes there'll be a thread that gets out of control in the middle of the night and you're not even awake. Um, it's not always you know, a volunteer necessarily who's, who's making the comments. It's somebody from the public. And there are a lot of radical people out there who will say um, some pretty awful things. And generally, we remove those type of comments, um, those of us who do moderate some of those pages. Um, but it, it is easy to miss them at times if you're not sitting there. Most 
of us have jobs and then volunteer and lots of other things that we do. So um, if you see something like that, I think it's good to message the administrator of that page immediately, and then you know, so oftentimes they just don't know that's happening. But I think generally, compared to some other uh, pages that I have seen and have followed, it's it's even worse out there than, than what we see here. So, but I think I agree, it's important. I, I don't know if anybody on staff that won't. If, I, I think that you know our message should be that we take it offline. If it's a negative issue, and work directly with staff or me, you know, volunteer representative or somebody. But because I don't think in any case, especially with this new team, that we're going to you know not be open to hearing what people's concerns are. But we shouldn't be debating that you know, in the public. Okay, thank you for bringing that up. That was a good topic. Um, I wanted to announce that next month we're going to have our PAC Act meeting at PAC. Uh, it's going to be in the multi or meeting room, multi purpose room, whatever it is. Um, and what we're going to talk about primarily is, uh, and I don't know how much time it will take, but we're going to talk about phase two. Uh, and what, I, what Krista and I have discussed. Uh, with our facilities project manager Marty is that we will bring in himself and uh, Lion Space, the architect, and we will facilitate question and answer with the public and the volunteers, whoever wants to show up for the meeting. There's a lot of, uh, there may be, there, there's a lot of questions about what phase two is, what it isn't, and I thought it might be best if we just address that head on and explain what's going to happen and, and give them a chance to answer and talk about the reason for why we're doing what we're doing. So, uh, and then I would, of course, like I always do, advocate that if you guys have more topics that you want to talk about next month, please let me know. Um, but I think that will probably be a good part of, of the meeting. And I'm hoping that because we're having a pack, we'll get a good turnout of people that might want to ask some questions about what's happening in phase two pack. My question is, uh, those are going to be calls to the audience, people that have input? Well, I might. Because I might, that's not, we can't address that. I might, I might, uh, I'm working on that. Okay. Uh, I might figure out, like, we might do a special session or something. Uh, let, me, let me work on that, where it's more of a public hearing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And as chairman, um, I can set the time that somebody gets to speak in a public hearing where it's not called the audience. So, but I have to talk, you know, probably with whoever the lawyers. Are. Yeah. I mean, I used to do it, but I'll figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or maybe I won't, won't uh, 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 start the meeting 